Some time ago, I was up too late, gorging on episode after episode of Breaking Bad. I knew there was going to be hell to pay in the morning when my alarm went off, but I couldn't help myself. What exactly was Walter White going to do next? And then there was a knock at the door. Now, as someone who watches a lot of movies, I was all too aware that good things rarely happen after a knock on the door, especially in the middle of the night. When I asked who it was, the response was to the point, FBI. Well, this couldn't be good, right? For me, it actually was. For one thing, I serve as a United States magistrate judge in the federal courthouse of Silicon Valley in San Jose, and the government was courteous enough to give me a call to say they would be coming. For another thing, the reason for the call and the visit wasn't to search or seize me. It was to search and seize someone else with the authority of a warrant. Now, federal agents don't usually ask me for warrants in the middle of the night, but they do ask me for warrants. A lot. Why? Because to do their important work, they need to search and seize stuff. And according to the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, they need a warrant to do that searching and seizing in all but the most exceptional of circumstances. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Think about the key terms I just mentioned, searches, seizures, and probable cause. When you're talking about the Fourth Amendment, a search can mean all sorts of things. Rifling through another's pocket, thumbing through a wallet or purse, these are two good examples. So can entering into a house, a hotel or a locker, or inspecting a backpack or a suitcase. Searching can also include listening in on an online chat or wiretapping someone's phone. It all depends on the particular situation, most importantly, on the target's reasonable expectation of privacy. The same is true for seizing. It all depends on the facts, the same way. But you're talking generally about detaining a person or taking, or taking possession of an object when you're talking about seizures. As for probable cause, that means more than a hunch. It means more than a sense. I think of probable cause as being reasonable to believe that evidence or contraband will be there. Figuring all this out is hard enough when the agent wants to search a house and seize drugs or maybe a gun. It's harder still when the place to be searched is a third party's data farm and the thing to be seized are the bits that comprise a Gmail account or an Instagram profile. And the reality is that for every request to search the former, I get 10 or 20 requests for the latter. So how exactly do I make sure each warrant looking for personal data that I issue is supported by probable cause? And how do I make sure that the accounts to be searched and the files to be seized are particularly described? There are three things that I try to keep in mind. First, when the police are looking to search for computer files, the standard paradigm gets flipped. In the traditional search, after a warrant to search a house is issued, for example, the police go to the house and knock and announce their presence. After tendering the warrant, they then search the house and seize the stuff. Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's guns. But when the FBI wants private Facebook messages, the Bureau just doesn't hand Mark Zuckerberg a warrant and then run through Facebook's campus, looking for data that is evidence of or the fruit of a crime. With data, the technology is such that it often takes several rounds to just serve the warrant. And even then, the government must take first and then search later. In fact, the way it usually works is this. As Google itself has explained, when Google receives a warrant, a screener is assigned. The screener is a person that sorts and prioritizes search warrants so that, for example, a child safety issue or a matter of national security gets top priority. Then, the warrant is handed over to a producer who examines the warrant for any errors, kicking it back if there is a spelling error in the username, and so on and so forth, and then investigates what information Google will actually provide. Often, they will contact authorities and clarify or assert that perhaps the authorities only really need a smaller amount of information, like emails from the last month instead of all Google Drive, YouTube, 
Google Plus, Google Maps. You get the basic idea. In addition, the producer makes sure the warrant is even in the right place instead of, say, Facebook, where it should be directed. All of this creates challenges, to say the least, when applying long-standing precedents and notions in Fourth Amendment case law. It also means that as cloud architectures have become the norm, and we keep less and less of our personal data on hardware that we actually own, government investigators are typically going to make copies first and then search it later. And because more cases begin with copying data that will be searched later, government investigators often will prefer and perhaps have to copy more than they actually need. What happens to the stuff that's extra? And who is responsible for making sure that it's handled appropriately? We all need to be thinking about that. The second thing I'm thinking about when I review a warrant application for online data is, is the data to be seized even in the United States? Well, we know that in 2012, something like 10% of the world's internet traffic was attributable to people in the United States. That means 90% was not. The companies who developed the most popular services may have started here, but they serve users that are mostly somewhere else. Facebook says that less than a quarter of its users live in the United States. I happen to have some extended family outside this country. My cousins, their kids, their grandmas, they are all on Facebook, not some homegrown variant. And Google tells a similar story. Twitter's the same. And forget the users for a moment. Even if the users are largely here, most of the biggest US providers store their data in substantial part on servers outside of the United States. Why does that matter? Just about every case that has even managed to consider how you apply the Fourth Amendment to personal information on the internet has assumed an internet that's inside the United States entirely, like back when it was the ARPANET. The suspects, the agents, and the electrons are all figured to be within our borders. And we know that's not true. Yet historically, anyway, courts have limited the protections of the Fourth Amendment to people who have made some kind of voluntary connection to the United States as a sovereign. Where agents have acted overseas, we either scrap the usual warrant requirement and instead look to the overall reasonableness when U.S. authorities conduct monitoring outside the United States. Alternatively, we look at whether the agents acted in good faith compliance with foreign law. So when there's a Yahoo account that's reasonable to believe contains evidence of a crime, do the protections of our Fourth Amendment necessarily apply? And how do you even tell? I mentioned three things on my mind when I get that agent's call or her visit in my court chambers. Here's the third thing. A few months back, the Supreme Court decided Riley versus California. Riley was a man stopped for a traffic violation. I think it was something like expired tags. And in the process of impounding his car, the police conducted an inventory search. The vehicle search uncovered hidden weapons, one kind or another, that led to Mr. Riley's arrest. The police then conducted a search incident to this arrest, and in that process, came across a touchscreen cell phone in Riley's pocket. The officer searched the phone at the scene and conducted a more detailed search of the phone later on at the police station. They came across various messages, photos, and phone numbers that led officers to tie the petitioner, Mr. Riley, to gang and drug activities. A unanimous Supreme Court led by Chief Justice Roberts held that this violated the Fourth Amendment. Everyone cheered, and they should have cheered. But beyond cheering, it's important to read exactly what the court was telling all of us. Cell phones have become important tools in facilitating coordination and communication among members of criminal enterprises and can provide valuable incriminating information about dangerous criminals. Privacy comes at a cost. Our holding, of course, is not that the information on a cell phone is immune from search. It is instead that a warrant is generally required before such a search, even when a cell phone is seized incident to arrest. Our cases have historically recognized that the warrant requirement is an important working part of our machinery of government, not merely an inconvenience to be somehow weighed against the claims of police efficiency. That's pretty powerful stuff. But even though our Supreme Court was unanimous in reaching this decision, don't be lulled into thinking this was a slam dunk. Three circuit courts upheld basically that the same seizure was okay. Another one rejected it, and the state Supreme Courts were all over the map. 
The lesson is that when it comes to balancing personal data privacy and legitimate law enforcement, there are no such things as slam dunks. And there are even fewer outside the very particular situation in Riley, a search incident to an arrest. Let me tell you, that's just a tiny fraction of the searching and seizing taking place every day in this country that I see. If the warrant requirement is an important working part of the machinery of government, as the Chief Justice wrote, I guess that makes federal magistrate judges like me a cog, or maybe a crankshaft. I better get back to that work. Thanks for listening.